John chapter 8 this morning. What a, uh, what a wonderful time so far we've already had worshiping our Savior, and we pray that'll be an opportunity to continue that through the preaching of the Word. I do want to encourage you, as I always do on Sunday mornings, if you have an opportunity, be here tonight. We are going to look at exactly what it looks like in somebody's life to trust in God. Uh, and so what are the marks and motives of trusting in God? And David's going to show us that in Psalm 62. And I'm really excited about tonight's text. It's a rich text, and I'm excited about uh, explaining that to you. But this morning's going to be a little bit different. Uh, we are gonna, we've been going line by line, verse by verse, through the Gospel of John. And we're going to continue that, but we're going to do uh, most of the exposition explaining of the verses, walking you through this story at the beginning, and then we're going to tackle a topic that this uh, narrative has to deal with in the second half of the sermon. And uh, I pray that the Lord uh, would, would bear fruit in our lives uh, once his word is applied to our hearts. So, if you got your place in your Bibles, in John chapter 8, would you do me the honor of standing for the reading of God's word? We're going to start in, in John chapter 7, actually, in verse 53, and then read through 8 uh, 11. John chapter 7, where well, we're going to start just that little phrase there in verse 53, and we're going to read through chapter 8, verse 11. Here is what the Word of God says. Everyone went to his home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, but when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone. And the woman where she was, in the center of the court, straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go. From now on, sin no more. Church, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Let's thank him for his word this morning. Lord, we do thank you for this powerful story, a story I'm sure many of us are familiar with, and yet... Uh, Lord, it's still a story that I think speaks to every one of our hearts. Understanding that, that we can place ourselves in the place of this adulterous woman. Lord, that you, uh, uh, being gracious and merciful, uh, have not condemned us if we are in you. But there is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so we celebrate that this morning. We pray that, Father, in your word, you would speak truth into our lives, that it, this would not be some ceremony that we come and check off our everyday list, but we would come hungry and thirsty for you to speak in areas of our life where we know we are in sin, where we know we struggle with unrighteousness, and you would, by your word, continually cleanse us, sanctify us so that we could be more like your son, Jesus. We pray this. We trust that you will do it. We're depending upon you to do it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, just right off the bat in verse 50, 53 here, we saw that everyone went home from the, the previous section. Everyone went home after the teaching about Jesus and the, the water of life, remember, and the, the festival uh, happening in that particular area, and then the division that was caused by Jesus. Everyone after that, they went into their own home. The Sanhedrin session had adjourned, and all the members have gone home. And then look at with me in the first two verses of John chapter 8. It says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. So it says that Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives and then comes to the temple early in the morning and begins to teach the people. I think, 
I think I was talking actually last night with my brother about some of our, our favorite preachers and, and some uh, that have, have come, come out and been strengthened in their faith and gotten better and how we, we love listening to all these great theologians. I think sometimes we miss the impact of the idea how wonderful this must have been that Jesus is teaching, that Jesus spent a lot of time in his ministry teaching the people. And you, have you ever been to a Bible conference or maybe even a church service and you come back just glowing, right? You come back understanding that God has spoken, just excited about what you've learned. Think about this. These people, they're not listening to any of the famous preachers of our day. They're not listening to any of the best preachers of our day. They are listening to Jesus Christ himself speaking to him. And, and you can't beat that. But this wonderful teaching time it's interrupted by something. And so if I were in that crowd that day, I would say, this better be important if you're going to interrupt Jesus. Well, in verse 3, we see what the interruption was. It says this, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. It says, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. Now, I want us to understand this. This woman was guilty. She was guilty of adultery. It's not a question of whether or not she was guilty or she wasn't guilty. She is guilty. The Greek word there, mortkia, would indicate that she is either married or betrothed. And betrothed in the, the New Testament time is not like our engaged, where you can just say, well, I'm going to walk away from this if I don't want to be engaged to this person anymore. I'm promised this person. I don't want to do that anymore. I just walk away. Betrothed was, was more like you had to get a certificate of divorce in order to not be betrothed to anyone else. That's why in, in Matthew chapter 1, I believe, where, where Joseph is called a righteous man for wanting to send Mary away, it's because they were betrothed. He would have had to get a divorce from her, which would have been and publicly shaming. So the idea is whether she was married or not, that as far as the law is concerned, it really didn't matter. She is guilty of a crime that was worthy, in this case, of the death penalty. She was guilty of adultery. Verse 4, again, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Verse 5, now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? The teaching of Jesus has been interrupted by what? Is, is Jesus a Roman judge? No. Is he a Jewish judge, civilly speaking? No. So why would the teaching of Jesus be interrupted for this? Is there any good reason for this? The woman is guilty. Scripture makes it clear that she is guilty. So why don't these men deal with the situation in a biblical manner if they're at all concerned about it being handled in a biblical manner? Verse 6. They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. This woman is being used by the priest by her pastors, by her ministers, is being used in order to make Jesus look bad. That Greek for testing there, it's parazo. Essentially, they want to lead Jesus to sin. They want to lead him to do the wrong thing. And as a side note, th think about this story as it's gone so far. And think about the fact that approximately 30 years before this story took place, a betrothed Hebrew woman was pregnant and her betrothed was not the father of the baby. It, it makes you wonder what kind of pain or agony that Mary may have gone through, even though she was not guilty in her case of anything. This woman, on the other hand, as opposed to Mary, she's guilty. But have you ever wondered this when you watch this verse, when you look at this verse, when you read this verse? Where's the man? I don't know if you know much about adultery, but it's very rare someone can commit adultery by themselves. It's a two-person act, right? And so yet we see no man here. We see no one here. It takes two. Where's the man? And again, why bring the situation to Jesus? I'm going to take a stab at this. In addition to the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus, remember, has an audience who will be listening to what he has to say that day. 
Now, if Jesus says stone her, then the religious leaders can tell the Roman authorities what Jesus has just said. Maybe they could get him charged with insurrection or whatever the case may be because he isn't loyal to Rome. He's not subject to Rome. Now, on the other hand, if Jesus says she shouldn't be stoned, then what will the people who have come to listen to Jesus have to say? Now, in this particular case, Rome is over the Jews. They have the authority over the Jews. And the Jews, as far as the Romans are concerned, have absolutely no authority when it came to the death penalty. They had a decent amount of autonomy, but they couldn't do that. What would happen to the reputation of Jesus if he claims he is 100% behind the law of Moses? He didn't come to break the law. So Jesus, in this particular case, could be stuck, right? What is he going to do? Let me ask you, do you really think that the scribes and the Pharisees care about this woman? Do you think they care about her soul? Do you think they even care about the missing man? They simply want to get Jesus. They're going to get Jesus. Do you think they even really care about the law? When it really comes down to it, they say they do. But if they have to use this woman in the law to bring Jesus down, then why not? So now Jesus starts to write in maybe just the most boss move in the entire New Testament, right? Jesus simply says nothing at this point, and he just starts writing in the ground, right? This is like absolutely insane. If I was one of the disciples in this moment, I couldn't help but be screaming with it. Oh my goodness. No, he didn't. He got you, right? Back up, boy. What's up? Yeah, like the whole, I would just be, if I was Paul or or Peter at this point, I'd just be talking straight smack to the Pharisees, and Jesus would have to rebuke me, because this is just the coolest thing that maybe has ever happened. He just starts writing in the ground. Ground. And I love this because we ask that question now. What is he writing? What does he have to write? Why is he doing this? And there are various opinions. I'd like to go over them with you. One, people, one group of people think that he's just buying time, which is weird to me. You ever watch a baseball game and you know the, the pitcher is, is on your team? He's just... He's done. He's just not doing well anymore. There's nobody warming up in the bullpen. And so you got to buy some time. So what happens or what used to happen before they changed the rules, the the pitching coach would slowly walk out to the mound, right? And he talks to the pitcher and the catcher for a while. And they're probably saying important things like, where are we eating after the game and such? And, And then he goes back slowly to the dugout and And then about 10 seconds later, the manager, and they're all old, right? They're all there walking very, very slow. The manager comes out to the mound, and they talk a little bit, and eventually the pitcher is taken out, and that gives the bullpen plenty of time to to warm up. If you don't know what that's like, you can come next week to our baseball game, and you'll you'll see that, right? So so believe it or not, it's all done to buy time. And so believe it or not, one of the theories is that Jesus is buying time. I I really don't think that Jesus needed to buy time, right? He created time, he owns time, that wouldn't be the case. But the second theory is that Jesus is just doodling, which I think is just hysterical, right? The idea that Jesus would so be ignoring these people that he's just drawing pictures in the ground, I think would be absolutely hysterical. I don't think that's the case, but that's one of the options. That may sound as bad as the first one, but the theory is he's down there doodling because he's essentially saying that civilly speaking, this isn't my business. What what business of this is mine? But there's a third possibility, this is the the popular one, is that down on the ground, he's writing, he's stooping over, and he's writing things like Caiaphas, Annas, extortion, adultery, specific sins that maybe these Pharisees have committed, basically pointing out to them that they're sinners too. Then there's also the possibility that he's, he's writing essentially showing himself to be judge, right? Judges in Rome would almost always have to write out their sentences first, then proclaim the sentence. I'm going to leave you a little bit hanging here, but the, the, the point I want to focus on right now is that these people, they don't care about the woman. They don't care about Jesus. They don't ca- seem to care about the true intent of the law whatsoever. In fact, in verse 7, we see that. It says, but when they persisted in asking them, He straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. These Pharisees, they aren't going to give up, 
And then Jesus makes that statement. He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. You know what's astonishing here? Being a sinner is, is not disqualification for being the person that throws the first stone. In the Old Testament, all the people who had ever thrown stones at people according to the law had something in common. You want to know what it is? They were sinners. It didn't disqualify you from throwing the first stone or the second stone or the third stone or the fourth stone. So what does Jesus mean here? Verse 8, again, he stooped down, stooped down and wrote on the ground. So he again gets down and he writes on the ground. And I'm going to throw you a possibility out here concerning what may have been going on. Whatever Jesus is writing and saying, I really do think lets them know that he knows more about this adultery situation than they are letting on. The woman is guilty. But is it possible that the group of religious leaders in one way or another were involved in this adultery? Perhaps they encouraged the man to seduce the woman. Maybe there wasn't much an encouragement whatsoever, actually. This is the time of the festival. Maybe there's just too much drinking or, or partying, and they saw a situation they could easily have put a stop to, but instead of stopping it, they encouraged the participants in one way or the other. When Jesus says, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. If this is the case, they had some sort of part in this adultery, how could they? How could they throw a stone? How could they if they were in any way part of the adulterous act? I'll throw out another side note here. that The writing actually may have reminded them of the book of Daniel. You remember the writing on the wall in the book of Daniel, chapter 5? In, in Daniel 5, 25, we read this. Now, this is the inscription that was written out. Mine, mine, tekel, a parson. And this is the interpretation of the message. Mine, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and Persians. So here you have Jesus with his finger writing, and perhaps they recognize that not only is Jesus judging them individually, but maybe as a nation as well. Then also the last word, Perez, that, that word actually has to do a lot with separation. Do you know why the Pharisees were called the Pharisees? Because years ago, you had godly men who were zealous for the law and wanted to separate themselves from the evil that was found in the Greek culture and kingdom. The names of those people were the Pharisees. Now, as time has gone on, the Pharisees have now become what their ancestors hated. Instead of being zealous for the law, they actually, in their actions, hated the law and even separated themselves from it. Then in verse 9, we see this. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone, and the woman where she was in the center of the court. All that remained there now was Jesus, the woman, and don't forget the crowd that was there listening to the teaching of Jesus. The ones he was initially and originally teaching. That's all that's left. And then we find in verses 10 and 11 this. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, from now on, sin no more. He says, where are they? Where are your accusers? They're gone. Jesus and his earthly ministry, it's not a civil magistrate. His role in this time was not to pronounce judgment or sentence in civil cases. He knows that she's guilty. She knows that she's guilty. But Jesus will not take on a role that is not his to take at this time. Now, let me ask you, because a lot of people have used this verse to support this. At this point in this story, is Jesus giving a thumbs up to this woman and saying, I affirm your lifestyle choice of an adulteress? No. Yeah, we in the disciples, we are an accepting people. No, he, he tells her, go and sin no more. What does that refer to? 
first to the sin she just committed. The only person that truly cared about this woman and cared about doing the right thing was Jesus. He understood the law and the original intent of that law better than anyone. The religious leaders who wanted to trap Jesus by using a person and misusing the law were defeated by Jesus. And I do find it interesting in that in the next verse, it gives us all the hope. We're actually going to look at just this verse, I believe, next Sunday morning. But verse 12 says this. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. I love this. Because throughout history, people who have lived lives like this woman have come to Jesus through the work of the Holy Spirit. They have seen the light. We need to be careful here not just to condemn the religious religious leaders, but we need to be careful not to twist the law of God, specifically the seventh commandment, which is what I'd like to focus the rest of our time on. The seventh commandment, for it to mean what we want it to mean. I want to look at the biblical sin of adultery for a moment. Matthew chapter 5, starting verse 27, says this. You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, we see here adultery being a specific sin that involves a married person. We see fornication in Scripture used between unmarried people. But particularly, adultery involves one person or both people being married or betrothed to someone else. I'm going to read some questions now from the Westminster Larger Catechism, which is essentially a catechism is a collection of principles based in Scripture. In fact, everything that I showed you would would have a reference of Scripture that I've I've kind of just... uh, brought out on the screens because I didn't want to to have you be confused. Uh, But a catechism is essentially a collection of principles, God, from Scripture on how we are to live that's taught to to a lot of kids and taught to a lot of adults. This is the larger catechism, which is, I think, mainly for adults. And So I'm going to read the complete answers because I I think, I'm not going to read the complete answers, but I think that these short answers will be helpful for us. Question 138 in the Westminster Larger Catechism says this. What are the duties required in the seventh commandment? The duties required in the seventh commandment are chastity in body, mind, affections, words, and behavior, and the preservation of it in ourselves and others, watchfulness over the eyes and all the senses, temperance, keeping of chaste company, modesty, and apparel. Then in question 139, it says, What are the sins forbidden in the seventh commandment? The sins forbidden in the seventh commandment, besides the neglect of the duties required, are adultery, fornication, rape, incest, sodomy, and all unnatural lust, all unclean imaginations, thoughts, purposes, and affections, all corrupt or filthy communications or listening thereunto, wanton looks, impudent or light behavior, and modest apparel. Now, can I ask you a question this morning? Have you committed adultery? Are there ways in which we as Christians misuse the seventh commandment? Because it would be easy for every one of us up here to say, I haven't committed physical adultery. But then you look at the original intent of the law. Are there ways in which we as Christians misuse the seventh commandment? This is an issue that I believe that the church as a whole fails to and does not want to deal with. But friends, can I tell you something? We're already seeing the effects of this. We will reap what we sow 
if we do not handle sexual sins biblically, and we have, it seems to me that we as pastors are trained by our people almost to stay away from sexual sin. If we deal with specifics, then we can be accused of either being a fundamentalist or legalist or perhaps even worse, perverts. So let me ask you a question that I want to spend some time answering. How should the church deal with the issue of sexual purity? I'll give you some possibilities. One is, we can make a lot of rules. We can make rules about appropriate hair lengths. You can make rules saying no one should go to the movies, listen to secular music. No one should ever dance. We could be the town in Footloose. (laughs) Maybe you were raised in a culture like that. Let me ask you a serious question. Did that really work? If, If we learn anything from the Bible, don't we learn that more law can't change hearts? And and listen, I'm not against rules in general. There are rules of the page household that we have. I'm not against laws in general, but we have to admit sometimes that more rules are not the answer. It's very hard to have these rules and endorse them biblically within the church without sounding exactly like the Pharisees. Another thing we can do is, is not only can we make a lot of rules, we can hide from the issue. And I dare say this is what we've done for years and years and years. We can hide from it. So let me just illustrate this with a point. There's, there's no doubt that when I left here as a, as a 21, 22-year-old guy and came back as, as a married 26, 27-year-old guy, those five years I lived in Memphis, I put on a significant amount of weight, okay? Um, I, let me just say the reason is all there ever is to do in Memphis is eat and or get murdered, okay? Um, those are the two things that you do. Uh, And so Memphis just has nothing but incredible, wonderful, unhealthy food. It is the, I mean, we're going to, we're going tomorrow actually to spend the week there to let Amy's family meet Emmett. And I'm so excited. And my cholesterol is like, you're going to kill us, right? So I, I'm telling you, it is outstanding. The food is great, but I realized something very quickly in my time there. Keeping the same size clothes that I came to Memphis with and putting on weight didn't really hide anything. My large shirts began to look like schmediums, right? It got to the point where in our youth ministry and Amy was eight months pregnant with Addie, I would consistently hear, well, when's your baby due, Pastor Cody, right? Now, what use would it be for me to tell myself that I have not gained weight and keep the same shirt sizes. Friends, hiding from our issues never really works. And we've done this as a church in regard to sexual sins. We've just pretended like it doesn't exist. And meanwhile, it's just running rampant. Absolutely everywhere. And we just live in this fantasy world. Or no, no one really is struggling with that. Another thing we can do is covering it with bad theology. Saying things like, well, expository preaching is just saying what the text says, what it means, and then leaving it there. Don't you apply it. Don't apply the text. That's the Spirit's job. Forget the idea that the Spirit might use the pastor, the preacher of God's Word, as the means and tool by which you should apply the text. Forget all that. Don't deal with any issues. If you think that's some sort of straw man argument, it's not, not, believe me. Another possibility is to only talk about the big sexual sins. So we will yell and scream about homosexuality. But these foundational issues that are really important have been falling apart for years. I think, in all honesty, on a a real practical level, that many in the church are leaving the church in regards to homosexuality, not so much even because they claim we're being intolerant as it is that they claim we're being hypocritical. We will pinpoint homosexuality 
while leaders in the church across America are cheating on their spouses and getting a six-month probation from their teaching responsibilities. It's hypocritical. It was always mind-boggling in high school to me to see these jocks on the football team that were sleeping with every other girl primarily, how they could sit there and rail against homosexuality being an abomination. Wait, you're telling me that your life isn't? You're telling me that God's okay with your sexual sin because it's the right gender? No! Let me tell you this. If you are out proclaiming all these things and you are actively viewing pornography, you're part of the problem. Instead, now maybe actually if we dealt with sexual sin in the church, we would have more of a voice to speak out in our culture against sins like homosexuality. If we lived in holiness in this respect, maybe God would give us a voice to be able to stand on some ground of righteousness, his righteousness, and say, this is sin. But instead, what we've done is we've said, well, at least I'm not that. At least I'm not gay. We have marginalized and minimize the sin of heterosexual adultery, and because of it, we've lost our voice and ground in the culture to speak boldly about sin. There's another possibility when it comes to how to deal with sexual sin in the church, and that is this. We could deal with it as the Bible deals with it. If you ever study Puritan preaching, I think it could be summed up like this. What does the text say? What does it mean? What are you going to do about it? And then tied in with all of that is the preacher points out the sins that are obviously in his life and in the lives of the congregation. Not by name or anything, but that's what comes out of this preaching. The people in the pew and the pastor have these wounds because they realize they're not measuring up and the pastor applies to Christ to the situation. He doesn't just leave people hopeless but he applies the hope of Jesus Christ to the situation. Someone pointed this out to me one day, and I'll admit this is 100% a generalization, but it is said this. It is said that men like to look and women like to be looked at. We are here as Christians to do everything to the glory of God. That includes how we dress and what we look at. Philippians 4.8 As we read this, compare this to what you've been doing in the last week, whether it be film watching or what you've allowed your eyes to see, what you've done, what you've said. Apply that to this verse, Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is ever of good repute, if there's any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Speaking to men, guys... If that woman is not your wife, that woman's anatomy is none of your business. None of your business. She is a person and she is not a thing. If she's a Christian, then not only is she a creation of God, but she's a new creation of God. You have no business treating her like a thing and no business thinking about her like a thing. But I don't think it's just Guys here, 1 Peter 3, as Brother Brad read in verses 1 through 6, says, In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, your adornment, your dress, must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Let me ask you, what should the main criterion be for the way we dress? I see here 
that we should be whether men or women be dressing to show off? Where should we be putting our emphasis? On the outside so that people would be impressed? Or on godliness? On inside? That is not to say that what we wear doesn't matter, but godliness comes from the inside out. Style must not be a major criterion for Christians as far as how they dress. The glory of God is. Churches today have a major problem when it comes to modesty and inner purity. Christian men and women alike are showing a lack of care for each other in the way that they dress, speak, and the way they look at each other. The Puritan Richard Baxter wrote this. If it... The matter of dress tends to the ensnaring of the minds of the beholders and shameful, lustful wants and passions. Though you say you intended not, it is your sin. That you do that, which probably will procure the reaction, yea, that you did not your best to avoid it. Though it be their sin and vanity, that is the cause, it is nevertheless your sin to be the unnecessary occasion For you must consider that you live among diseased souls and you must not lay a stumbling block in their way. You must not blow up the fire of their lust. You must not make your ornaments snares to entrap, but you must walk among sinful persons as you would do with a candle among straw or gunpowder. Or else you may see the flame which you did not foresee when it was too late to quench it. I like that quote for men and women alike, by the way. We are, male and female, guilty. Ladies, show your love for your neighbor and your Christian brethren by dressing in a modest manner. Now, in saying all this, in no way am I blaming women for the lust problems of men. Men's self-control is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Control yourselves. But the way the Christian women are dressing today is a contributing factor. You do not want to stand before a holy God being accused of being a stumbling block. I made the statement earlier, admitting it was a generalization, that men like to to look and women like to be looked at. And while there is a huge, saddening growth in our culture in regards to the amount of women who are actively viewing pornography, I would like to talk directly to our men this morning. I would venture to guess that some of you have a pornography problem. I figure that you already know that's a sin. I also figure that you may feel trapped. You may have felt defeated, dirty, and helpless. And I say that because as I've said before in my testimony, I was there. From the ages of 12 to 22, stuck in the sin of viewing pornography if not on a daily basis, on an every other daily basis. And I felt trapped, hurt, shame, continually pondering, God, am I yours? Am I really yours? But friends, let me tell you, there's grace to be found in Jesus Christ. There's hope to be found in Jesus Christ. If that is you, if you are here today feeling this, I want you to know there's hope. Look at the verse after our story this morning. It shows us that Jesus is the light of the world. There is hope. There's the gospel for you. The same grace that that saves you is the same grace that will transform you. And I know it because I've experienced it. And it's beautiful because there's nothing I did to own it. There's nothing I did to deserve it. It was given to me as a gift You may say, but I've done this, I've done that. I've done these terrible things that I'm so ashamed of, and it's affected my family. I'm not saying that the consequences of your sin will ever go away. There are still consequences from my sin that I struggle with that I still feel the effects of to this day. It's affected my relationship with people. But think about the story of the Bible. Think about the gift of the Bible. Think about David. Remember, David didn't just commit adultery. He cast his country into a historical position that they'd never recover from. The splitting of the two kingdoms can be directly tied into David's sin, yet he repented. And who is called a man after God's own heart? 
David, whose songs do we sing? David. What about Peter? Walking on the water, he loses it and he starts sinking. What about Peter? Get behind me, Satan. What about Peter? Three times denies Jesus, and yet, when the greatest event was going to occur in church history, when God's presence would come to be made available to everyone in the day of Pentecost, who did God pick to preach that day? That miserable failure, that miserable flop that committed sins that were abominable. What about the Apostle Paul? What was he guilty of? Murder? The murder of Stephen? Friends, whether it be sexual impurity or any other sin, there is hope for the Christian. Galatians 5, 16 through 26. Paul, the murderer, says this. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, and drunkenness, carousing, and things like this, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice, that is, continue to do such things, never repent of such things, will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Verse 24, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Friends, whether it be bad habits in the way we dress or more obvious obvious in the ways of sexual impurity or any other sin, once again, there is hope for the Christian. But God can never forgive me of that. Yet what does the Bible say? If we confess our sins 80% of the times, he is faithful and just? No. He simply is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Any of you, who may not be Christians, God simply calls on you to repent. But he couldn't forgive me for the things I've done. I've had an abortion. I've committed adultery. I've been involved in ugly things that I cannot even talk about. God says repent. He says go and sin no more. He doesn't tell us to give excuses. We're told to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, friends, I believe this woman at the well... I believe her response, or this woman, the adulterous woman, I believe her response to this was repentance. I believe that the reason she wasn't stoned right there for that particular sin is that Jesus knew he was going to bear it for her. He was going to take it. He was going to take the stoning. He was going to take the wrath she deserved, and he'd bear it for her in grace. And friends, it was when I realized that that God granted me repentance. And my prayer is the same for you. No matter what sin you're dealing with, would you believe that Jesus bore it for you? That he took it for you? Out of grace, out of his love, out of his compassion, he took your place and gave you The right standing that is found in Christ, in Christ alone. If you would but by his grace repent and believe, it can be yours today. I pray that you take hold of that. Believe, repent.